Good morning. How is everybody? Good. I'm so glad to see everybody this morning. Um, you guys are going to have a great program. We have some wonderful speakers um, that are really going to talk about, um, give us a lot of information on uh, breast cancer, um, risk stratification, um, and really an update since last year on what's been going on in the management of breast cancer. Um, I'm the messenger. I'm just going to sort of give you a brief update of what's going on today um, and um, let my uh, other colleagues um, give you a lot of information. Um, so just as I always do, I like to give a recap of where we are with breast cancer, where we've been and where we're going. Um, as you all know, breast cancer is the most common um, cancer among women, and it counts for nearly one of three cancers um, diagnosed in American women. Um, close to 200,000 women will, have, will be diagnosed with invasive breast cancer with an additional 47,000 um, cases of what we call in situ or DCIS breast cancer, which is stage zero. Um, this slide um, is, um, and I'll see if I can point to it. On the top gives us the uh, incidence or the number of women that have been diagnosed with breast cancer um, over the past decade. The bottom in the black on the left-hand side tells us the number of women who have died from breast cancer over the past 10 years. The good news overall is that the numbers are going down, and that's due to the increase, the advances that we've had in breast cancer treatment. Um, there's a similar um, trend for ovarian cancer, but we're really talking about breast cancer today. Um, but when we break this down, and when we talk about um, African American women versus white women, and we're talking, and this is black as black women, and this orange bar is white women, what we're seeing over the past 10 years is that the gap in mortality is widening. It's not closing. And that's been the problem or the conundrum that's been facing us in oncology is why is this gap not closing? Um, with all the advances, this disparity in mortality rate still exists. And it's not even, it's not that it hasn't closed, it's widening. So this is something that we're trying to address. And that's why we're here today, and that's why we still have these conferences, unfortunately. And so there's lots of reasons for why this is, and we can spend a diff have a different conference just talking about this one slide. Um, some of it can be attributed to um, lack of awareness among providers, um, access to care for African American women, um, lack of insurance, and just removing barriers such as um, education and knowing when to go for your mammogram. Um, and also support in low, uh, minority and low-income communities. So this is a problem that we still need to address despite the overall success that we've had in this country with treating breast cancer. So, so African-American women are, dis are still disproportionately affected by breast cancer even though we do not get it at the same rate as white women. So I put this slide up and you'll see why in a minute, but um, this says how much of breast cancer is hereditary, because we hear a lot about hereditary breast cancer and women having prophylactic mastectomies and the BRCA gene, you hear about it in the news. Um, a very small portion of breast cancer is actually hereditary, about 10%. The majority of breast cancer, women who get breast cancer, this yellow pie is about 80% is what we call sporadic, meaning that there's there's no, there's no genetic component that we know of, okay? So that's, a, that's the real reason why every woman over 40 should be getting a mammogram, because every woman's risk, remember, one in eight. One in eight women in their lifetime is, will get breast cancer. Um, and then we have this orange pie, this orange slice, which is 15 to 20%. And those are the women that have what we call family clusters. They may have multiple family members with breast cancer, but they don't have a documented genetic component. They don't have a hereditary breast or ovarian cancer link. They just may have several family members that may have had breast or ovarian cancer, okay? So um, when I see patients, what I like to do and what I try to talk to my residents about is risk stratification because it's very easy to see. You're busy in clinic, you're seeing a lot of patients, and you try to lump every woman together. You can't do that because how you how you approach your patient is going to determine how you manage that patient. 
And so you really have to think about what category am I going to put my patient into? That's gonna determine how I screen that patient. So, and what a lot of the mistake we also can make is we either put patients into a dual category, high risk or low risk. And that's not, a, that's not good either. That's not good enough for us. It could be low risk, it could be moderate risk, or it could be high risk. Um, and that really has a huge impact on how we screen patients, and that's what we generally do um, as breast surgeons. And so, and, and also, it also helps us to educate our patients. And many patients get scared. They see that they may have had lots of, um, may have had a family member, or they may have had two friends that died from breast cancer. They come in asking for an MRI, and we want to have a really educated discussion with, with my, I want to have a discussion with my patients as to why they may or may not need that MRI. And it's based on scientific evidence. So the, who's the average risk patient? That's going to be that patient that falls into that yellow part of the pie, really. That's the patient that's that one in eight, okay? So um, does it, that patient has, is probably going to have no personal history of atypia, meaning abnormal cells on a breast biopsy or cancer, there's no genetic predisposition, predisposition to cancer, no, that means no BRCA gene, okay, or no other gene. And so when we do lifetime computer modeling, we do this in our own office, um, there's less than a 20% risk of developing breast cancer. That's your average woman on the street. Um, now that does not mean that you ignore that patient and just say, okay, you know, Mrs. Jones, you're great, you're fine, your breast exam is good, see you in a year. What that means, though, is you do have to screen them and educate them, because most of those one in eight breast cancer patients are still going to fall in that pop from that pop population, right? So um, we go by screening at start, um, screening at 40. Um, U.S. Preventive Task Force says 50. So whatever you go by, make sure you have discussed it with your doctor. But most cancer organizations still recommend 40. Um, I would. And I would, I would certainly um, go for that with, with African-American women. You need an annual clinical breast exam. And the self-breast examinations have become more and more controversial. Um, I personally do not see any reason why women are not capable of doing self-breast examinations. So women should do, get in the habit of doing self-breast examinations and doing it on a monthly basis. And also educate um, and be educated about knowing the signs and symptoms of breast cancer. So while this group has the lowest risk, this is actually the population where most of our breast cancer cases are going to come from. Make sense? Okay. So then we can go on to the moderate risk patients. So these are the patients that have a little bit of a higher risk, but these are not your BRCA mutation patients. Okay? This is not someone like Angelina Jolie who had bilateral you know, prophylactic mastectomies and has an 85% lifetime risk. But there is an increased risk. These patients may have a personal history of atypia or, or what we call LCIS or libular carcinoma in situ. These are high-risk lesions. They, that puts them at an increased risk for breast cancer. These patients I may see twice a year, okay? Um, these are patients that may have a first-degree relative with breast or ovarian cancer. One relative. Not, I'm not talking about three relatives. One relative. It could be a patient who has a relative in their 60s or 70s. Um, patient who had a history of chest irradiation at 30. Um, it could be a patient who has a greater than 20% risk of um, lifetime risk on computer modeling, um, a low penetrance um, gene mutation. And, um, and so these are the patients that you want to keep an eye on. Um, I would probably see them twice a year. And, we want, and these are the patients I will have a discussion with about <laughs> strategies for risk modification as well. And so how do we screen these women? Um, and this is a discussion you have to have with your doctor. Usually we start screening 10 years prior to the youngest case of breast cancer in the family. Okay, so if your mother had breast cancer at 45, you start at 35. You don't wait till you turn 40, okay? Um, and so that's something you really, that's why you really have to stress your family history with your physician. Um, some patients may benefit from going on medication called CIRMS or selective estrogen receptor modulators. Tamoxifen is the one that we, that's most common, okay? And that has been shown to reduce the risk of preventing breast cancer. It's also used to, 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 um, to treat breast cancer. Um, these patients may benefit from MRI, um, not all. And that's where you have to have the discussion with your breast surgeon, 
about whether or not an MRI is helpful or not. Um, and then again, having the clinical breast exam and doing your self breast exam and, and also, also talking about other lifestyle modifications, stopping the smoking and cutting out on red meat and all these other things that we'll talk about later. And then the highest risk patients are the ones that have the high penetrance hereditary breast and ovarian gene mutations. And these are, they could be untested first degree relatives of a patient with um, one of these genes. That's the BRCA mutation gene. So this is someone who was like, who is similar to say Angelina Jolie or Christina Applegate that was very, that you might have read about in the, in the media that went ahead and, and, um, and proactively um, had uh, prophylactic surgery. And so why is this so important? Even though it's a very small slice of that pie, the reason why it's really important to discuss your family history with your doctors is because you need to be tested. You need to be referred to a genetic counselor. The patients that are BRCA1 will have up to an 85% lifetime risk of developing breast cancer. Your risk of developing a second primary cancer, so this is not a uh, this is not a metastasis or a cancer that spread from the first one, it's a brand new cancer, is up to 60%. And then the risk of developing ovarian cancer, which is also very difficult to screen for, is between 15 to 45%. So these patients really need to be um, identified and, um, and, and, and they have to be under surveillance very, very um, often by both a breast surgeon and a GYN oncologist, okay? So um, that's why they fall into um, this special category. And the, with the BRCA2, these patients tend to develop breast cancer a little bit later in life. Um, the BRCA1s can develop breast cancer as early as in their 30s. I've seen BRCA1 patients get breast cancer in their 20s. Um, these patients get them a little bit later, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, but still, the risk is, lifetime risk is high, 50 to 85%. And the risk for ovarian cancer is a little bit lower, 10 to 20%, but still much higher than the general population, okay? And um, BRCA, um, BRCA2 is associated with male breast cancer. So if you have a family history of an uncle, a grandfather, your father had breast cancer, um, there's a high likelihood, extremely high likelihood that you have this genetic mutation. It's an autosomal dominant mutation. What that means is it can be passed on to any of your children, 50% um, risk, and it can be carried down on either the male side or the father's side. So when you think about your family history, don't just focus on your mother's side, also focus on your father's side and get that family history, okay? And so we generally screen these patients with um, uh, alternating mammogram and MRI every six months. Um, I also have our patients come in at least twice a year, if not more, for a clinical breast exam. These patients are more likely to get cancers that don't show up on mammogram, which is why we also get the MRI. Um, and uh, the tamoxifen, or, which is a CIRM, is help, can be helpful for the BRCA2 mutation carriers. Not so much for the BRCA1, and the reason why is they tend to get what's called triple negative breast cancers. Those are cancers that are, um, do not express hormones, estrogen, progesterone, as well as HER2. So um, for that reason, we don't generally recommend medications for those patients. And um, for patients that really don't want to go through con continual surveillance, they say, I don't want to come every year for a mammogram and an MRI. Um, it's just very stressful. I'm tired of having biopsies that turn out to be negative. Um, it's very reasonable for these patients to want to have bilateral prophylactic mastectomies and with the reconstructions that our plastic surgeons can do, which you'll hear about in a, in a little bit later, um, it's a very, very um, reasonable con uh, decision to, to, to have. Um, and so this, I'm not going to go through this whole long slide, but these are all the guidelines that we go by now for recommending patients for um, genetic counseling. And um, it's getting a little bit more complicated, but we know, but this is what we do. And um, I'm sharing it with you because I think patients need to also be their own advocates and know their history. And also if your doctors, your primary care doctors may also not be aware of it. So sometimes you have to be your own advocate and say, hey, I have this family history. Do you think I should go to see a genetic counselor? Um, because 
um, we're finding more and more of these BRCA genes in African American women when it was previously thought that it was just mostly something that um, uh, was found in, say, white women, specifically Ashkenazi Jewish women. And, um, and the issues with genetic testing is that, unfortunately, we still are testing women after the cancer diagnosis. The whole point is we want to test women before they get cancer so that women have options, that they have choices that they can make with their life, um, whether it's to have be, whether they want to just continue to be um, uh, screened um, six, uh, twice a year or to take medication versus having pro prophylactic surgery. You don't want to, you really don't want to wait until a cancer diagnosis to figure out that the patient is a BRCA mutation carrier. Um, it's kind of late, right? You know, then the options are very limited. Um, so we're really missing out on young women and African American women. It just, it's just not in the, it's just not in the mindset of many patients as well as pr um, primary care physicians that African American women should also be tested. And, and, and interestingly, actually, the rate of BRCA2 mutation is actually higher in African-American women. People just don't realize that. It's slightly higher, 2.6%. And an article d a, that just came out last month in, um, in cancer found that in young women um, uh, that were diagnosed with breast cancer in Florida found that the rate of BRCA mutations was much higher than expected. So they went through all the young women that were di under the age of 50 that were diagnosed with breast cancer, and they found a 12% rate of BRCA mutations, okay? So, um, and that's quite high. So uh, it's probably higher than you expect, but you won't know unless you test. And so, and now that um, patients that are under 50 with triple negative breast cancers has been added to the NCC guidelines, I believe we'll, we'll find even more um, African American women with the BRCA mutation because we're, we're seeing the, re the relationship between triple negatives and, and BRCA mutation. So we're testing all triple negatives regardless of family history now as part of, um, as part of the guidelines for genetic testing. So I'm just going to end here. Um, so I just bring, so this all brings us back to why we're here today to discuss um, the, this disparity and how, what we can do to close this gap, okay? Because we have all these, we have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we have chemo RT, we have so many, um, we have tamoxifen, we have aromatase inhibitors, we have so many ways and methods of treating breast cancer. We have to figure out why, we, why um, black women are not benefiting. So we have to fix that. Um, and um, you may or may not have seen this article um, that was published last year in the New York Times which addressed the study that came out from Avon about this issue uh, of the, the racial gap that was nationally. And um, some states are, are worse than others. New York actually is not as bad as the rest of the country. Um, but um, I urge you to look at it if you haven't. You can just Google it, New York Times. Um, and it, is, it really is, um, it really didn't tell us anything that we didn't know because we're doing, we're on the front line, but it really does highlight the fact that um, over the, the past 20 years, we went from having African American women and black women having similar mortality weight rates to now having um, a widened rate. So again, um, this, is, um, this was a really nice article that was published last uh, March. And, um, and Dr. Freeman, who you probably have heard about from Harlem Hospital, also wrote a an opinion piece about a week later about the same issue. Um, and I urge you to read that as well. And we'll talk some more about health disparities later this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to end here. And we have a really great panel of speakers who's going to um, also talk about um, radiation therapy, which we haven't um, discussed in a past couple of our conferences. Um, uh, and uh, we'll talk about reconstruction options for women who do need to have mastectomies, and we do have a higher mastectomy rate. And so many women are not offered in New York State. You do know that it is the law that all women need to be offered reconstruction if you're having a mastectomy. Um, uh, and so, but our reconstruction rates are much lower. And, um, and what kind of reconstruction is also the question. And so uh, we, um, it's important to know that you do have options for reconstruction. And we'll talk about clinical trials. Those are important. If you have um, advanced disease, locally advanced breast cancer, your survival is going to depend on your treatment you have and where you go for your treatment, uh, whether you go, you're at an academic center versus a community hospital. So clinical trials are very, very important. People tend to shy away from them and feel like you're, you're in an experiment. But clinical trials are extremely important in the, in the, in the treatment for breast cancer. 
Um, and uh, we'll have um, someone, a really wonderful person from mindfulness meditation um, talk about how um, meditation can really be helpful in, um, in uh, recovering from breast cancer. And I'm just gonna end with this quote um, from Martin Luther King. Um, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. Okay, so I hope you have a wonderful morning and um, I'll come back later to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.